I'm Marie Jose Kravis. I'm the chairman of the Economic Club and the a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the 485th meeting of the Economic Club. The club is 111 years old. And as you know, it is the foremost national forum for discussions on economic policy and geopolitical issues, both domestically and internationally. Um, I'm very happy to welcome today uh, the members of the Centennial Society whose support uh, has ensured the financial stability of the club. Many of you are here and are at the head table and many are at the front tables and I really want to thank you for being so generous and steadfast in your support uh, of the club. Uh, we're also delighted to welcome several of our Economic Club 2018 fellows who are attending today. Later today, the 50 2017 and 2018 fellows will be getting together uh, to um, network and to prepare for their October 22nd debate, which will be held at Bloomberg. And all club members are invited to this event. But what you've all been waiting for is, of course, the speaker who kicks off this season. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend, a longtime member of the club, and, of course, our guest speaker, Larry Kudlow. <laughs> So, Larry serves as Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Director of the National Economic Council, and in that function, he leads the coordination of President Trump's domestic and global economic policy agenda. Prior to the White, Ho prior to the White House, you all knew Larry, of course, as a CNBC senior um, correspondent and contributor and, of course, a host of the CNBC's primetime show, The Kudlow Report. He also served as chief economist and senior managing director at Bear Stearns. And, of course, when he um, served under uh, President Reagan, he was also a top economic advisor uh, on economic policy. The uh, first part of our program uh, will be a remarks will consist of remarks from Larry, and um, we will follow then by a conversation with uh, our board member and also CNBC television star, Becky Quick. So without further ado, let me introduce Larry, give him the podium, and I'll be back uh, to introduce Becky more formally. So Larry, to you. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here. I appreciate the great turnout. I have been a longtime member here and board member and uh, some or other, so it's great fun for me. I, I want to note, it's just interesting, here we are, uh, September 2018. It was almost to the day, almost to the day that uh, then-candidate uh, Donald Trump uh, spoke uh, at this club two years ago, September 2016, during the campaign. Whatever kind of coincidence that is, so be it. And I, I just want to note briefly his message at that time because I think much of what he, much of what he promised is coming true, even though there might have been some skeptics um, just to begin, if we lower our taxes and if we move, remove destructive regulations and we uh, unleash our vast treasure of American energy and if we negotiate trade deals uh, that will put America first and help our workers, then there is no limit to the number of jobs we can create 
and the amount of prosperity we can unleash. Lower taxes, roll back regulations. Um, his policies end the war on business, end the war on investment, end the war on success, reward success, don't punish it. We've seen probably the fastest, most abrupt increase in various measures of confidence ever, ever, almost the day after the election. I mean, you look at things just the last week or two, we're still drawing at small businesses based on the NFIB, uh, record highs, consumer sentiment, 17-year highs, a whole variety of things, almost from the day after the election, but it continues to rise. At the time President, uh, then candidate Donald Trump spoke here, he laid out a 4% economic growth goal, 4% economic growth. He said that if he won, the administration's baseline would be 3.5%. We eventually settled on a 3% uh, baseline and create over 20 million jobs in 10 years. And he talked about helping the forgotten men and women of America. Cops and soldiers and teachers and firefighters and young and old and moms and dads and blacks and whites and Latinos. It's been quite remarkable. And so now we find ourselves in a position I guess 3.2 percent first half growth, 4.2 percent second quarter growth. The Atlanta Fed is expecting better than 4 percent growth. We'll be happy with anything above 3 percent growth. With respect, I acknowledge our critics who believe we couldn't get better than 1 to 2 percent growth. The reality is we're moving forward on those policies and on the results. So I would say this. The single biggest story of this year, 2018, the single biggest news story, not fictionalized versions of what goes on in the White House and all the rest of it. The single biggest story is an economic boom that virtually everybody thought impossible. That is the story. And I believe the recent successes are not one-off, they are not one-time, they will be continued and sustained because of the policies. Not only a new growth spurt, I'll go to some numbers. Take a look. Besides the confidence numbers, which continue to amaze, a story recently, a few days ago, published in that famous supply-side newspaper, the Washington Post, above the fold. Blue-collar jobs growing the fastest since 1984. Blue-collar jobs. Those were the forgotten Americans that then-candidate and now President Trump talked about. Uh, in the past year, 650,000, 3.3 percent annual rate. Rural America jobs are growing at 5.1 percent. Across the board, paychecks are getting fatter. Median incomes continue to rise. Data point after data point. Industrial production, retail sales, ISMs. U.S., the hottest economy in the world today. We're crushing it. Capital is flowing here in huge quantities. Not just repatriation, where we have made it easier, bring back uh, the money from overseas, but also new investment coming into the United States. I wish our friends around the world would, would emulate and imitate our policies of lower taxes and uh, deregulation so they could pick their growth rates up as well. But we are getting the money right now because we are at an economic boom that virtually everybody thought impossible not so long ago. I just want to make these points. The incentive model works. I've been around a while, have argued for many years, as per my former boss, Ronald Reagan, actually from my book, John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, if you lower tax rates, and by the way, ease up on regulations, 
You keep more of what you earn, you keep more of what you invest, you keep more of what you risk, and people will do more of it. Cut taxes, and the economy will grow. It's a model that's been used, worked in the 60s, 80s, 90s, didn't work the last 20 years because we went in the wrong direction. Now we're moving back to the right direction, the incentive model. The tax plan was always based on a very simple theory, well-rooted in academic literature and uh, actual history, lowering business tax rates, large and small, needed cash expensing, and in our case, uh, easier repatriation of overseas money will create incentives to grow. So we're talking about capital formation. It's as old as the literature. Capital formation. And the data show it's already working. It's early. I appreciate some of our critics don't agree. I respect that. I know many of them. I always listen to them. But they had their chance uh, for eight years or longer with heavy regulations and spending and taxing, now we've brought in a different model. Give us a chance. Give us a chance, I ask you. And note that the early results are positive. The economic boom is the biggest story of 2018, and in my judgment, it will continue. So if we provide more capital per worker, the old K over L ratio, it will, over time, with better equipment, manufacturing, training, improved productivity, output per hour. We are already seeing early signs of a pickup in productivity. I know it's early. I grant you that. And it's still not where we hope it will be, but we're moving in the right direction. And with that will come an increase in real wages and better jobs. I mean, we're seeing some remarkable indicators. Real wages. Rising. My colleague Kevin Hassett of the CEA put out a study after taxes and inflation. Actually, real wages are rising at 1.5%, 1.4%. We're seeing big increases, 3% increase in real disposable income after tax, after inflation. Median wages are rising now, I guess the highest in 10 years. I acknowledge it's only been a year or so. But we're moving in the right direction, and the numbers continue to support this view. So more capital investment, more productivity, more jobs, and fatter paychecks, a healthy economy. The employment story has been solid. Unemployment rates, I guess overall 3.9 percent, and even more remarkably, Unemployment rates for all various categories of minority groups are hitting historic lows or multi-decade lows. I put this out there because I think um, in the hubbub of, uh, of Beltway politics, a lot of this is lost. I don't want it to be lost. The blue-collar workers are gaining, as I've said before. The job openings are at record highs. Even the quit rate. More folks are quitting their job. You know why? For better jobs. More people are coming out of the labor force to work because the wages have increased. This is good stuff. It's out there. Now, I know that U.S. is a free market economy. The government doesn't run the economy, essentially, at least not yet. But I would say, as I always have, government policies matter a lot. And an incentive-oriented policy where we aim to increase the economy's potential to grow, as I said, things that have happened in the past, new policies matter a lot. And I think that's part of the big change we are seeing. And again, it's not just a numerical change. It's an atmospheric change. It's a confidence change, rarely seen, rarely seen. So I will leave it at that. And let me suggest last point. Uh, I know there will be questions on trade. Let me say this. Somebody who's worked with the president now 
in office for six months and before that. I've known him many years, interviewed him many times on my former network and elsewhere. To my lights, the trading system around the world is broken. And it's been broken. Maybe for as much as 20 years. The post-World War II trading system, which predominated as a free trade reform to the problems just before, during, and after World War II, it was a good system. It was governed by rules, and people essentially played by the rules. Unfortunately, that system is broken down. Free trade is a great concept. I certainly support it, have my whole career, and continue to do so. But free trade has to be fair trade. It has to be reciprocal trade. What we're seeing, you're seeing, is countries are raising tariffs, non-tariff barriers, subsidies. The World Trade Organization has become dysfunctional. The biggest culprit has, in fact, been China but not the only culprit. And I will say right here on China, we are ready to negotiate and talk with China any time that they are ready for serious and substantive negotiations towards free trade, to reduce tariffs and non-tariff barriers, to open markets, to allow the most competitive economy in the world, ours, to export more and more goods and services to China, to help them. We are ready to have that discussion any time as long as it's going to be a serious discussion. But the reality is we cannot permit the theft of intellectual property. We cannot permit the forced transfer of valuable technologies. We must strive for American ownership of American companies in China. And in their country, they had been reforming along free market lines for several decades, the Deng Xiaoping reforms, but that seems to have stopped in recent decades and indeed moving in the wrong direction. President Trump argued at the G7 and elsewhere and since then that he is a free trader, that he wants to move towards zero tariffs and zero non-tariff barriers and zero subsidies with reciprocity each step of the way. That is his view. People are blaming the president. I say do not blame Trump for this. He inherited this trading mess. He's trying to fix it. He is a reformer. It's not an easy task. But to protect the American economy and protect American jobs of all stripes, Manufacturing, non-manufacturing, you know, these blue-collar numbers are very positive. We hope to hang on to that. We have to be tough. Prior presidents have raised the issue of unfair trading practices and the lack of reciprocity, then they go away. President Trump's not going away on this issue. He will be strong and determined. And trade reform is necessary. Moving towards free trade is absolutely pro-growth. And that is why I support him, and I'm working with him, and Secretary Mnuchin and the others, and Lighthizer and so forth. So I urge you to think this through. The person who's trying to fix the system is not the problem, he's the solution. And again, as in other cases, give him a chance. We've only been doing this four or five months. Already we've made some progress. We have a deal with Mexico. We're negotiating with Canada. We're negotiating with the European Union. We're negotiating with Japan. And as I say, we stand ready to negotiate with China anytime if they are willing to move towards serious talks to remedy trade problems. So low tax rates, lighter regulations, opening up energy, steady dollar, low inflation, a hot economy. I still think it's the biggest story of 2018. 
And I think it's a story, as long as these policies are intact and not overturned, that's going to continue for quite some time. America is a great nation. We have a great economic history. From the end of World War II to the 2000, we grew at 3.5% a, a year. Don't tell me we can't get back to that. Don't tell me we're locked into 1% to 2%. We're not. With the right policies and the right incentive structure and the right freedoms and the right support of businesses and individuals and entrepreneurs and innovators and creators, we can continue a new success story. The President mentioned it here two years ago, almost to the day. It's my great honor to serve him and to remind you of his goals. And there's no turning back as far as we are concerned. I thank the Economic Club in New York for having me. I'm honored by all this. And uh, I'm gearing up for my pal Becky Quick and her various questions. Thank you very much. So th thank you, Larry. I should have mentioned in the introduction your book, which was entitled Prosperity and American Abundance. And uh, I see that you remain faithful to your basic principles. And I thank you for taking the time sharing those ideas with us. And I'm happy to welcome, as I said, Becky Quick, a member of the board of the Economic Club of New York. You all know Becky as the co-anchor of Squawk Box and also the anchor of the nationally syndicated On the Money. Becky received a number of questions that many members submitted through our website portal, and I thank all of you. She's reviewed them and curated them. And Becky, uh, to you and uh, Larry for more in-depth discussion of our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Jose. Um, Larry, thank you, and thank everyone here. It's really an honor to be here with you and share the stage. Uh, Larry and I have been friends and colleagues for over 15 years. Uh, but this is a great opportunity, and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Becky. Um, you talked an awful lot about the economic landscape, mm -hmm. where we've come. There are a lot of questions in this room about where we head from here mm -hmm. and what could happen to offset some of the momentum we've seen in the economy. The first and foremost has to be what's happening with trade. And I know you just addressed it a little bit, but let's talk about what's happening here and find out. We have heard there have been reports that there are going to be additional tariffs introduced on another $200 billion of Chinese goods. Um, we've heard that those tariffs could run as high as 25%, although most of the reports today put it at closer to 10%. Can you tell us anything about what we might be hearing? Well, I don't want to get terribly specific. Uh, the President has suggested uh, tariffs on a couple hundred billion dollars. He has not been satisfied with the talks with China on this. Um, my guess is announcements will be coming soon. Again, I don't want to front run them on that. Mm -hmm. I think the basic stories are probably more or less correct. S straight out of our meetings, one of the things I've learned, it's quite remarkable, is you have a high-level meeting, all the phones have to leave the room, right? But you may as well have a direct mic into the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> stuff, stuff get, is that? Uh, so, again, I don't want to be specific on that. The President has talked about it, and um, announcements will be coming soon. We have not seen a massive reaction in the stock market to this. Yes. Some people have been surprised by that. Have you? Uh, well, you know, yes and no. I mean, I think in its wisdom the stock market sees. First of all, the big story here is the change in policies that I mentioned before and the economic boom which is emerging. I think that's really the big story. I mean, stocks are close to an all-time high. Profits are close to an all-time high, along with the other data points that I, that I mentioned. Uh, the tariff story may be a very good force for good. Don't rule that out. It's, like I said, people want to people blame President Trump for fixing a broken system. And I think that's unfair. So the stock market, which may be discounting, I don't know how far in advance, maybe it's saying, you know what, some of these reforms are necessary. And they're being done cautiously. There's lots of discussions. 
inside the government and with private sector people. I understand there are disagreements, as is always the case when you undertake big reforms. But I don't see any reason to think at the present time that the President's trade reforms are going to damage the economy. In fact, I think the President's trade reforms will help the economy. And just one recent example is Mexico. Sure. You know, that's a good thing. And my hope is uh, we'll get more progress with Canada, the European Union, Japan, and perhaps China. I don't want to rule out China. I'm just saying that um, we still await serious talks, that's all. So I think that's why the stock market is, is, continues to do very well. These may be positive developments long term. Well, we talked to a lot of people, obviously, on CNBC, and most of them, when asked why they don't think the stock market's been impacted, say they think that this is a negotiating tactic, that this will eventually be resolved, that they don't anticipate seeing the full additional 200 billion tariffs come on, or even the 267 billion after that, um, that they would weigh things differently if they thought that was a real threat. What do you say to that? Well, I don't want to get, again, I don't want to get ahead of the president, and I don't want to get into a lot of details about this, but it is a grand strategy of negotiating. It is President Trump's uh, brand and style. He's tough. Mm -hmm. He's laid out his goals. I think they're very sensible, as I say. It is a free trade strategy, but it's hard to make the reforms. So whether they're long term or not, I think they're necessary. And we'll see. You know, we'll see how this uh, plays out. You know, I, I remember um, years ago w w when I worked for President Reagan when I was a child, um, <laughs> I, go, I go to the White House once every 35 years or so. <laughs> I remember Mrs. Reagan correctly uh, developing an anti-drug strategy by saying, just say no. Remember? She was right. I would say to the Chinese, on something of substance, just say yes. It takes two to tango. We put out our asks. We're open to talks, as I said, at any time, to just say yes to a couple things, and then let's move on. This can be done. Trade's tough, I get that. Everything's tough. Tax cuts are tough. Rolling back regulations is tough. The president's whole agenda is tough. You know, he's keeping promises. The reason I a little belabored the you know, economic club in New York two years ago, he laid out a platform, mm -hmm. and he's making good on it. So, Keep hope alive. The Chinese officials, or at least some who have spoken to the media, have suggested that they have every intention, or had every intention, of coming and having trade talks, but that they felt like they were antagonized when these additional tariffs were brought up again last week. Um, what, what should we read as the narrative? What's, what's really happening? We will see. We will see. Again, uh, we welcome any time serious talks with China. Absolutely. The door is open. And the President uh, has said many times he has a good relationship with President Xi. Uh, I have a good relationship with uh, Vice Premier uh, Liu He and his team. Uh, our team leader on this, Secretary of Treasury uh, Mnuchin, mm -hmm. is in touch and communicating. So, say yes. Larry, the president tweeted, tweeted this morning, and I wish I'd brought up the actual text of it, but he tweeted something along the lines of how the tariffs haven't really shown up in prices, at least not on grand scale yet. And while you can see it in certain areas, maybe in steel prices and lumber prices in different areas, that's true on a grand scale. Um, but tariffs are taxes, mm -hmm. and the more that you ramp up, the more you would expect to see some sort of ripple through our economy. Is there a point that you're worried um, if we're looking at $250 billion in total of tariffs, does that get to the point where you start to think these are taxes on American consumers that will disrupt what you have been trying to build? Well, we're looking at it carefully. We're following it very carefully. I don't think we're near that point right now. I mean, I, again, I think the singular story here is an economic boom that most folks thought was impossible. That's really the big story. Uh, with respect to the impact of tariffs, 
We'll see. I mean, we're following it. I don't see any problem right now at all. Also, there have been questions about certain companies. We had uh, an analyst we spoke with today who says he watches Apple shares as his proxy for how concerning these talks are, that Apple would be one who would be potentially hit pretty hard. I just wonder, is there anything you watch as a proxy? Is it the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Is it the dollar? Is there anything you're watching to say, OK, it's all clear, we can continue? Well, we try to watch everything. Uh, on Apple, by the way, we, we've spoken to Mr. Tim Cook many times. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very smart guy. He's given us some good advice. Um, sure, I mean, we're watching currency markets. We're watching stock markets. We're watching as much as we can possibly watch. I mean, the, you know, I, I think right now, you know, one issue is the Chinese stock market has had a very rough time of it this year. Mm -hmm. And I think their economy is, uh, is softening quite a bit. Now, whether you can relate that to the tariff story or not, uh, I would just say my own personal view, uh, something called state-run capitalism doesn't work. It never has. It never will. I don't think the Chinese gang particularly agrees with that, but we will see. But look, we try to keep an eye on everything. Our data, their data, European data, everybody's data. Uh, we have a terrific uh, Council of Economic Advisors. The Treasury is hard at it. Um, we know, we know that it's not easy to make reforms. Okay, but that's the president believes that's the right path. I happen to agree. He believes he has a mandate to do that. And it's not monolithic. I mean, we just signed, Congress just passed this um, uh, 1,700 tariffs were reduced. Um, we're willing to do that. So it's uh, always aimed. Uh, but again, in order to level the playing field and get some reciprocity and get to what we euphemistically call the three zeros on tariffs and non-tariff barriers and <laughs> subsidies, you're going to have to take tough steps. Maybe it's a wake-up call. What advice did Tim Cook give you? Pardon? What advice did Tim Cook give you? <laughs> Actually, the uh, only thing I'll say on that with Mr. Cook, all conversations are private, but uh, he really loved our tax reform. Really loved our tax reform. <laughs> He said it to me in my office up on the second floor, and he's, I went down with the meeting in the Oval Office. He said it to the president, president like that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the strong economy and what the implications will be in a lot of different places. Um, at some point, the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise interest rates, and expectations for how quickly that will happen have risen as the economic numbers have improved. Um, there was also someone who laid out to us this morning this theory that if you see additional tariffs, that will increase the inflation numbers. That will, in turn, force the Fed's hand sooner. That, in turn, could lead to a stronger dollar. And, and how does all of that play in? Have you thought about that? And where do you think we're headed with some of just the Fed rate, rate hikes? Or is it happening for a good reason or for a bad reason? Look, I, uh, first, first point, Fed is independent. Mm -hmm. Fed is independent. Uh, that's a key point. The second point is inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So you can have individual or specific price increases or price decreases depending on a whole variety of things, supply and demand and so forth. Um, that's not, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Uh, if the dollar were falling rapidly, that would be a signal of inflation. It's not, it's been steady. That's great. Great country should have a steady, reliable currency, and we do. Um, only, only thing I'll say, and it's just my view in general, you've heard this before, uh, more rapid economic growth is not by itself inflationary, okay? More people working and prospering is not inflationary. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we haven't had any cap goods increases in almost 20 years. We haven't had any real wage increases in almost 20 years. We've had some, but very little. If the workforce, which is producing this boom, uh, can't get wage increases, when can they? And that, how can that be bad? How in the world could that be bad? And, and I would say how pleased I am that you know, Chairman Jay Powell has made the same point on a number of times. Uh, and that's good. So that's just my view. I'm not uh, 
interfering with their independence. I, I just think we're on the same track. I think that's great. We spoke recently with Jim Bullard from the St. Louis Fed, the president there, and he raised some concerns about the inverted yield curve. Mm -hmm. And if the Fed continues to raise rates, whether they will go ahead and invert the yield curve, what that might mean. Do you have any concerns about that? Well, I follow the yield curve, always have. Um, to maybe redefine the original model at the New York Fed, and, and pardon me, but I can't, the fellow's teaching at RPI, or he was, he spent the New York Fed long, long, many years. That model was the, the yield on 10-year treasuries relative to the three-month treasury bill. Mm -hmm. And it's still positive, 90-ish, 95 basis points or so, something like that. Don't quote me to the nickel, but it's more or less that. Um, that's okay. That's fine. That's not a recession signal. I think the recession probability from that model is very low, 12-ish percent, something like that, 13 percent. So that's pretty good. Um, so using that model, we're fine. That's all I'll say. Let's talk a little bit about CBO numbers that were put out last yes. week. Um, these are the numbers that are for the first 11 months of the fiscal year through August. They showed that receipts at Treasury were up 1 percent, but that spending was up 7 percent. And so as a result, it indicated that the budget deficit would be targeting about $895 billion for that period of time. That's $222 billion of, ahead of where it was a year ago. Do you have any concerns about the budget deficit? And what would your solution be? Or well, these I numbers? Actually, this is one of the rare moments when I will publicly agree with the CBO, which is unusual for me. Uh, the gap is principally spending too much, I think by a couple of hundred billion increase. The revenues, as you noted, are up slightly, even with uh, the tax cuts. Um, I wish more people would take note of that, and I wish the CBO would, would talk more about that, because their own estimates uh, from before the tax cuts and after the tax cuts, in other words, roughly mid-2017 and mid-2018, they revised uh, nominal GDP from which revenues uh, are derived, um, something on the order of $6 trillion higher, which using an average tax rate of 17.5 or so percent, uh, really cut the deficit back um, by as much as a trillion dollars over the 10-year period, which is another way of saying we just about paid, not quite, but we paid for about two-thirds of the total tax cut. And my suspicion is we financed uh, through growth and this increase in GDP, um, pretty much financed the business tax cuts. All right. Now, I agree, we spend too much. I absolutely agree. And we're working on it. We're working on it. Will the Trump administration tackle entitlement reform? Well, we've already tackled a, a big part of the newest entitlement, namely Obamacare. And as you know, in the tax bill, we, um, we eliminated the individual mandate and a lot of other reforms uh, involved with that. And we're still chipping away on a regulatory basis uh, to reduce the burdens and the inefficiencies of that. Uh, we're not for state-run. We're not for uh, single-payer uh, health care. So that was the first tackle. We've also trying very hard to deal with a lot of workfare issues, very important part of the president's agenda, where we had some very good reforms in the 90s um, Republicans and Democrats, Gingrich and Bill Under Clinton, Clinton yeah. right. Uh, very good reforms on welfare, for example. Um, work requirements, eligibility requirements. Unfortunately, much if not all of that was undone in the last uh, 20 years. I can be bipartisan here, Republicans and Democrats, so we're trying to patch that up again. Food stamps still near record, where unemployment has fallen so much, things like that. So yeah, we're going there, the smaller entitlements. As far as the larger entitlements, I think everybody's going to look at that um, probably next year. I, I don't want to be specific. I don't want to get ahead of our own budgeting, uh, but we'll get there. But I agree, we have to be tougher on spending. Um, people are quick to blame 
you know, deficits on tax cuts. Well, I don't buy that. Tax cuts promote growth and wages. Revenues come in. Federal, state, and local revenues come in. Uh, we're going to run. We're going to run deficits of about four to five percent of GDP in the next year or two. Okay. Uh, I'd rather it were lower, but it's not a catastrophe. It's just not the biggest thing in the world. Uh, and the, going down the road, of course, we'd like to slim that down as much as possible, and, and we will work at it. But I, I will say, as I always do, um, the single biggest factor affecting the budget in general and these macro numbers on deficits and debt is the rate of economic growth. If you grow slowly for long periods of time, you're going to have greater deficits. If you grow rapidly, you're going to have lesser deficits. It's true for federal government and state and local governments. Growth solves a lot of problems. So, glad you asked. Um, our policies are aimed at growth and prosperity. You mentioned bipartisan efforts, and I say this a little tongue in cheek, but bipartisan efforts seem to be Republicans in Congress working with this administration. <laughs> what, what happens if? the Democrats actually take control of the House and or the Senate? What, what happens to any of your plans at that point? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to get too political uh, on this story, but I understand that there's a risk. I, I'm assuming nothing here right now. I'm not here to forecast politically. But I, I would just say this. Given the fact that we've emerged into this economic uh, boom, if you will, it would be a shame if efforts were made to unravel the policies or overturn the policies, okay? And I think that argument is going to figure very heavily in the November elections. The success of the economy and the success of the policies, and I think it would be a um, you know, great disservice to, the, to Americans if we overturn those policies, all right? I don't want to go much further than that. But not surprisingly, we got here. As I said, I still think the boom is the biggest story of 2018. There was a time, Marie cited a book I wrote many, many years ago, not so long ago, a year or two back, I did something called JFK and the Reagan Revolution. JFK, the Democrat, right, was the first post-war supply-side tax cutter. And it worked beautifully. 4 or 5% growth, virtually no inflation. 20 years later, it got off the rails. Ronald Reagan came in, a former Democrat, and, and uh, emulated the JFK tax cut. And Reagan gave him credit for it. Now, that was a different Democratic Party. I get that. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen again. Maybe there's a role model there. I just, from whatever source, I don't want to get too political. But I just want, don't overturn the good work that's been done. Don't overturn, for example, the explosion in blue-collar jobs. Don't overturn the increase in confidence. Don't overturn the capital that's flowing into the United States. You know, it, it's working. It's working. Is that an admission that Tax Cut 2.0, which would make these tax cuts permanent, um, is not going to happen before November? I don't think so, but I, I think it's, you know, making the personal tax cuts permanent is a very good idea. Um, and there's some assorted savings accounts in there. I think uh, uh, Kevin Brady is exactly right. I think there may be a vote. I'm not 100% sure there may be a vote on that. No, I don't think it'll pass. Uh, it'll get through the whole uh, Congress. But it's a good message. I think it's a good message. And I think we can do a lot more on tax reform going you know, down the road. The Joint Committee on Taxation has looked at uh, Tax Cut 2.0 and said that it will add over 10 years something like $657 billion to the deficit. They also say that the deficit would be $1.8 trillion under that law instead of $1.5 trillion under current law by the year, I think, 2028. Um, do you quibble with those numbers? Always. <laughs> That was a setup. I mean, even the 1.5 trillion, which is the sort of agreed upon, as I said, with the new revisions in the nominal GDP baseline, the real GDP baseline, the revenue baseline, we've already paid probably, even by CBO's estimates, uh, roughly two thirds of that whole tax cut. 
So, you know, one of the wonder, wonders of Washington is these models, the debate about static versus dynamic scoring, and that debate may never be settled. But, you know, I, when candidate Trump spoke to the New York Economics Club, I, I was sitting right behind him uh, that day as a board member, but uh, obviously I contributed to that plan. And he declared a 4% national goal for economic growth, okay? And I just thought it was wonderful. There was a debate inside the campaign, and uh, the four percenters won. So then I got four, and now he wants five. But that's a good thing to shoot for. And I say nothing but good, if we reach that goal, nothing but good will come of it, nothing. I can't, you can't grow it fast enough. It's just a great thing. It helps everybody. It helps, it helps everything, not just these numbers. It helps prosperity and confidence and, and, and jobs. Every American working, what is there, 155 million some odd Americans working right now, and the number is rising nicely. They're all benefiting. Everyone benefits from that kind of growth and prosperity and economic health, and paychecks are getting fatter. How can that be bad? Hmm? How can that possibly be bad? How can that be bad for budgets? We're giving more revenues. Can't be bad, I'm sorry. Larry. No, I could go on and rant. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't mean any, by the way, it's not personal. They're professionals in these shops. It's not, I don't do personal at all. I'm just saying, Lord help us from some of these models. This room has, serves as a church on the weekends, so this is all appropriate <laughs> sort of preaching. Um, I, I want to end on a, on a little bit of a philosophical note. I'm, I'm not sure if you saw David Leonhardt's column in the New York Times. I believe it was on Friday. Um, I read it over the weekend. But he lays out this idea that the government statistics that are reported don't necessarily completely report life as it is for many Americans, that, that they fall short, particularly when it comes to inequality. Mm. Um, he's not blaming this administration. He's mm. just saying that for decades, the numbers have getting, gotten further and further apart and don't reflect things like the 15% of men aged 25 to, to 54 who are now not working. Um, they don't reflect things like household net wealth uh, that has dropped 20% since 2007, even while the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 60%. Household net wealth? Household net wealth. You just hit a record, 100 trillion. And he more. talked about how those numbers that he laid out have not recovered to the same extent that the oh. stock market has. Oh. And that many of the gains we've seen in GDP going back to the year 2000, where there's been 28% increase in GDP, um, haven't gone to the lower 90% of Americans. Do you see inequality like that? And do you think that there's any way to A, record that or B, fix it? And again, these are not things that have happened under this administration, yeah. just a longer term problem. Well, the measurements are always an issue. Yeah. And from time to time, the government tries to, uh, to make them better, yeah. all right? And you know, distinguished economists, much smarter than me, will we'll go after that. We've had periodic changes. A lot of people argue inflation is, way, is measured too high, way too high. And if that's the case, then a lot of these other numbers would improve with a lower inflation rate, the real numbers would be would be better. It, I, I don't know, Becky, that's an ongoing discussion. I think it's a fair topic um, to discuss. I want to just, again, in a philosophical sense, on the, on the newsroom floor of your station, network, and my old one. Some people refer to me as the happy warrior. <laughs> I actually have some of the same charge in the White House. <laughs> um, I believe, personally, always have, that a strong, healthy economy is not the only factor. Okay, I get that. Not the only factor. But I think that this country and probably others, but this country is always happier, friendlier, more confident when the economic winds are blowing warm. In the book we wrote a couple, almost two years to the day, 
I think that was the opening chapter. Americans were cranky, pointing fingers at each other, not happy campers. I sense it myself. I travel around a lot, or I used to. So apart from the statistics, I think there's an emotional content to a better economy, where opportunity is strong, achievement is strong, where we do reward success, not punish it, and where we help each other and we don't point fingers. You follow? It, this is all qualitative stuff, Kudlow stuff, I don't know what it is, but I'm an optimist and I just think in terms of who we are and how we relate to each other, our level of civility, for example, things are always better when the economy is better. Okay? I just believe that. It's not the only factor. Gosh knows. My own life, I've learned a lot about uh, faith, for example, and the things that, that made my life better. But you, st <laughs> you start with economic prosperity and health, things just get better. I, I just believe that. We, we're an optimistic nation, okay? I learned that from President Reagan. I've learned that from President Trump. We are an optimistic nation. And as long as we're on the right track and as long as we're expanding, we will be optimists. We've had a rough patch. I think that rough patch is ending, okay? That's my view. Others may not agree. I appreciate that and I respect different views. You know that. But I think uh, if this economic boom that I described, so it's sort of like the greatest story never told. If this continues, okay, and this continues, and I hope it will, and I hope it's not overturned, elections or not, we will be a better country. We will be a better country, we will be a happier country. Larry, I just, believe that. I just want to thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. And I just want to thank Becky and Larry. We could have gone on and on, and you've set a very high standard in launching the season. And speaking of the season, I hope you'll all join us October 1st for Ben Silberman, the CEO and co-founder of Pinterest. We have quite a heavy month of October. We have 10 events, and uh, I hope you'll come to as many as possible. So enjoy lunch, and again, thank you, Becky and Larry.